For 25 years, Kenneth Jiggins has been a close friend of the farmer Peter Fairbold, who farms White House Farm in Retted in Essex. Kenneth helped Peter with the pheasant and duck shoot. A track close to White House Farm called Workhouse Lane contained a single metal gate across the track, which led to fields, a pond, a wood and further onto the farm. The gate would have normally been locked in the shooting season, which was from mid-July to the end of February. On the 6th of December 1995, Mr Jiggins went about 4pm to feed the pheasants and ducks, but it was too late to feed the pheasants, so he just fed the ducks. He drove back through the gateway and locked the gate about 5pm. He thought the snow had just stopped, and there was no other vehicle on that route. The next morning, on the 7th of December at 7.45, he went to the yard and he met Peter Theobald, and he both drove in the Land Rover down the track. On the track... There was a lot of snow and ice over the puddles, but none of the ice had been broken. It was about 8am that they came across a blue Range Rover parked facing the gate. They stopped 20 yards in front of it. Mr Jiggins went to the driver's side to ask whoever was inside to move so they could get through into the field. He did not look through the window, but he tapped on the driver's window. It was because he got no response that he did then look through the window and saw what must have been a dreadful sight of the driver, Craig's Rolf's head, lying to one side of the window, with blood coming from his nose and mouth. The front passenger, Tony Tucker's head, was slumped forward, and there was lots of blood to his head and chest. Mr Jiggins only noticed the two bodies in the front, and called to Peter Fearbold, telling him what he'd seen, only mentioning Craig Rolf and Tony Tucker. As Mr Jiggins was making a 999 call, Peter Fearbold went to the Range Rover and said, there's one in the back as well, Patrick Tate. They got back in their Land Rover, they then turned around and went back to the A130 to await the police. Mr Jiggins had just called on his mobile. P.S. Atkins and P.C. Knights came after about five minutes and left their vehicle at the start of the track. All four, the two police officers and the two farmers, walked back towards the top of the lane. But the two civilians did not go as far as the two police officers and waited further down the track. The following is the statement of P.C. Barry Knights from the 7th for the 12th, 95. At about 8.17 hours on Thursday the 7th of December 1995, I was on duty in uniform in company with P.S. 580 Atkins, engaged upon mobile patrol in a marked police vehicle on the A130 at Retterden, Essex. When in response to a radio message about a suspicious death, we attended an unmarked road between Whitehouse Farm and Retterden Hall. As we arrived, I saw two persons who I now know to be the witnesses, Mr. Peter Fearbold and Mr. Kenneth Jiggins, who introduced themselves to me from my open front passenger window. They had a vehicle with them, a Land Rover. Mr. Jiggins informed me that he had called the police. I then got out of our vehicle and said to Jiggins, where's the vehicle? Jiggins replied, at the end of the track near the gate. I then said, have we tried knocking on the window to get a reaction? Jiggins replied, They've been shot. There's blood everywhere. I then turned and said to PS 580 Atkins, who was sitting in the driver's seat, I believe talking on the radio. Apparently there's blood everywhere. I then began to walk down the unmade track away from the A130 in the general direction of East Hanningfield. Both Jiggins and Fearbold walked with me, and PS 580 Atkins just behind me. At this time, visibility was reasonable and the temperature was cold. There was approximately two and a half centimetres of snow on the road and surrounding areas or the red vehicle had clearly been down the track as there were two tyre tracks along the road where the snow had almost disappeared. We walked for approximately 175 yards before walking around the right hand bend in the road. I was immediately aware of a dark blue coloured Range Rover which was parked on the track approximately 75 yards ahead of us. The vehicle was facing away from us. I could only see the rear of the Range Rover. At this time, the engine of the vehicle wasn't running and none of the vehicle's lights were on. The doors of the vehicle were also closed, although the sunroof was tilted up slightly. As we walked closer, I could clearly see the registration number of the Range Rover, which was F424NPE. When we were 25 yards from the vehicle, PS580 Atkins asked both Jiggins and Fearbold to stop and wait, 
Whilst we approached the vehicle at this point on the ground, there were tyre tracks where a vehicle had turned around recently, moving off of the track to the right before moving away. Where the Range Rover was parked, the track was quite narrow, with the hedge on either side almost up to the track edge. I could see that there was a farmer's gate approximately 5 yards in front of the Range Rover which appeared to be closed across the track. The Range Rover was quite dirty and I could only see the area of the rear windscreen where the wash wiper blade worked. From the rear of the vehicle I could only see two people, both in the front seats. I then walked to the off side of the vehicle. Immediately saw three blue style shotgun cartridges lying in the snow near to the driver's door. I then looked into the vehicle through the driver's window. The driver was sitting with his head leaning on his left shoulder. I could clearly see a large wound on the right side of his jaw neck area. He was a white male with short dark hair and a stocky build. I then looked at the person who was sitting in the front passenger seat. He was slumped slightly forward with his head forward and his chin on his chest. He was an icy one with longer dark hair than the driver. He was wearing a dark top with two stripes down the sleeves. I then noticed a third icy male in the rear of the vehicle. I stepped back until I could see through the rear offside passenger window. The male in the rear was sitting in the rear near side of the vehicle, leaning forwards against the near side passenger window. The window was actually smashed. I then walked around the rear of the vehicle and stood at the rear near side corner of the vehicle. I saw a blue coloured shotgun style cartridge on the ground outside the rear near side passenger door. I then looked at the broken rear passenger window. I could see the rear of the rear passenger's head leaning against the broken window. It had a large wound, clearly visible. I then told PS580 Atkins about the cartridges as he also looked into the vehicle. I then walked round the back to Jiggins and Fearbold and said, Where did you drive to? Fearbold replied, Right behind the Range Rover. I then said, Are these your tyre tracks turning around? I indicated the markings in the snow I'd seen earlier and Jiggins replied, Yes. That was us. After a brief conversation, PS580 Atkins and both Jiggins and Fearbold left me at the scene. Due to the injuries and skin colour of the three males in the Range Rover, I formed the opinion that all three were clearly dead. I then remained at the scene to protect it and assist other officers when they arrived. At 13.15 hours, I was released from the scene and returned to South Wooden Ferris Police Station. Cross-examined at the court trial, Mr Jiggins said that the A130 was a very busy road mornings and evenings. 7 to 9 in the morning, 4.45 into 6.30ish. He also said that courting couples used the track as a lover's lane. There was a padlock on the gate for 6 to 8 months replacing one that was lost and there was a fishing syndicate of about 10 to 15 people who would have several keys. There was a way to the gate from the other side but you had to go across fields. Close to the track is Retterdon Hall which is on a higher ground and had a view down onto Workhouse Lane. The lane was fairly low down and then rose up to Meadow Road. Mr Jiggins did not see any signs of well defined shoe prints and he did not walk around the Range Rover. His own Wellingtons were size 9 in size. They were taken from him by the police. He did not look for cartridge cases. Cross-examined in court, he did say there was some snow on the ground on the morning of the 7th of December and in certain parts there was some fluffy snow and ice. In other parts that were sheltered there was very little snow. Mr Fearbold gave the similar impression about the gate always being locked. In cross-examination, Mr Fearbold said all the shooting syndicate had keys and there was 10 or a dozen keys to the gate. They had retreated from the Range Rover so not to interfere with any marks. Mr. Fearbold's own Wellington boots were taken. Their vehicle had not been down the track after 7pm on the previous evening. The next morning they had to defrost their Land Rover. There was no frost or snow anywhere on the roof or the windscreen of the Range Rover. No steaming up on the interior. He would have expected it to be frosted up if it had been there for many hours. In cross-examination, Mr. Fearbold had said there was enough frost to need to defrost his own vehicle. His own vehicle had been parked since 5pm the previous night at the farmyard, which was fairly open to the weather. PC Knights looked for a pattern of anybody walking down the lane, but there was no signs except for the vehicle going down. There was points to indicate people had been up to the scene. P.S. Atkins said that he had been very careful not to disturb anything and not let things be trodden on. He tried not to tread on the footprints. 
His own boots were taken for testing and he would have expected any footwear of anyone who went near the vehicle to be taken to be tested. He was the first person there apart from the farmers. He could not define what footprints there were but they were in different directions around the vehicle. He could not define who made them. He did not touch any cartridge case. He only noticed the three on the off side and the one at the near side. He got bomb tape from his vehicle and put it down the track to one side. Nobody wandered down the track. He was in the turning area and he did not see anyone where he was. From his position, nobody could come past without seeing it. Nobody did, whether a member of the public or a reporter or whatever. It was PC Knights who drew attention to the fact that the temperature was up because the snow was melting and things were changing. Sergeant Christopher Atkins had come down the track with Mr. Knights and had seen Mr. Jiggins and Mr. Fearbold. When he looked at the Range Rover, he saw no obvious snow on the roof and he saw the bodies. There was about an inch of snow on the track and no snow on the vehicle. The windows were not iced up. Then PC Morris joined them and they went down the track and kept a log of those attending at the A130. He said in cross-examination it was the middle of a cold spell and all vehicles out for a length of time would have had ice or snow in them. He had Doc Martin type boots on but not Doc Martin's with a block pattern. He said, once we were aware of what we'd got, meaning the site he found in the Range Rover, we were very careful where we put our feet. There was quite a covering of snow at that time, about an inch. Foot marks can be of valuable assistance. He walked halfway down the near side of the car and did not remember any cartridge case on the near side. He would have recorded it if he had. He was taking great care, bearing in mind what he was looking at. He said there was a thousand and one things on his mind when he was looking inside the vehicle.